For a career in motorsports, the Sterling Moss had the right pedigree. My father raced, uh, it was always a dentist, he raced in Indianapolis. My mother had uh, driven uh, competitions, you know, trials and so on. But none were a match for the extraordinary talent of Sterling. And the young Moss persuaded his father to support his early forays into racing, helping him buy a Cooper for his 18th birthday. I remember one day we were coming back home and we went past Cooper Car Company, which in those days was a front window, and in there was a 500. I said, oh, Dad, let's, look, let's go and have a look at it. We went over, stopped, and went to have a look at it. And, of course, luckily, Charlie Cooper, John's father, uh, had known my father at, at Brooklands. And uh, so they got chatting and so on. I said, what about letting me have, buy one of those, Dad? Well, I'd won some money at riding horses. And I said, look, I can put up a certain amount from that and, you know, will you let me have a bit? And we could use the horse box, take the divider out to take the car around in. And anyway, he agreed. His faith paid off. A succession of impressive performances in hill climbs led to Moss Senior suggesting his son take on a continental season in 1949. I got the, got the Cooper, went to the hill climbs. I, luckily, I think I was fourth on the first one, and then I won all the rest of the ones that year. And uh, then John Heath came to me, and John Heath had built a car called an HWM, which was Hersham Walton Motors, and he built this two-seat race car. He said, would I drive for him next year? So I leapt at that, and, and Lance Macklin and I were the team, and we'd go around every weekend going to places like Sable de Lone and, and aix les Ban, and you know, all these different San Remo. Fantastic life. I mean, can you imagine a better life than that for, for a kid of 17 years old, going all around this place and all the pretty girls, you know, all the crumpet was there. <laughs> and a fantastic life. He went on to make his Formula One debut in Switzerland in 1951, finishing eighth, and went on to make his first charge for the championship four years later, taking his first victory at the British Grand Prix at Aintree in 1955. The British Grand Prix was run at Aintree. Works teams from Ferrari, Maserati, Van Wall, Gordini and Connaught were there, as was Neubauer and four of his silver cars to be driven by Fangio, Moss, Kling and the veteran Torufi. I did actually qualify for pole in practice, uh, but there were no team orders. The only team orders with Mercedes was when a Mercedes, doesn't matter whose it was, had 30 seconds lead, believe it or not, on the next car in the race. Then they put out a sign that said REG, Regulari, in other words, hold your position. And of course at, at Aintree, uh, I didn't have as good a start I think, as Fangio. Anyway, I dropped back a little bit and then I managed to catch him up and I managed to pass him. And then I went as hard as I could. The four Mercedes led the field. Moss, Fangio, Kling and Turok. I said to him quite often, you know, did you let me win it? Because the sort of guy who would say, look, it's Sterling's home Grand Prix. What the hell, I've got so many others. And he said, no, no, he said, it was your day. Well, it was my day winning. So whether it was my day because he backed off a bit, I don't know. I, I truly don't know because he's, he's such a gentleman. He would never have said anything, you know, that wasn't right. To the unbounded delight of the huge crowds, Sterling led across the line to win his first Grand Prix and to go down in history as the first British driver to win this event. That same year saw Moss's all-round driver skills come to the fore with a stunning drive in the Mille Miglia. Alongside navigator Dennis Jenkinson, Moss won the 992-mile public road race 32 minutes in front of the legendary Juan Manuel Fangio, something Moss regarded as the greatest drive of his career. Oh, I have to put it at the top, because the, the driving style, you see, driving on a racetrack you know, you know exactly where you know where you go into the corner, where the apex is, where you come out, and all that stuff. You know all that. When you go on a road race like the Mili Mila, a thousand miles, um, you don't know any of the corners and the people standing on the side, so you can't see. And so the style of driving, you go into a corner um, and realize as fast as you possibly can, and then if something suddenly happens, you back off like that heart, and then throw on correction and you just hope that you can therefore get round the corner. And so driving when you know exactly where you want to be is one thing, but going out there and then driving and then saying, so God, this is tighter than I thought, and you tighten it in and have to put correction on to save it, is, is a different style altogether. And I must say, it's um, very exciting. The amazing thing is that Jenks would give me signals which would be right, slowly, be, you know, really 
serious like that and so and I could interpret those for miles an hour and my foot on the throttle it's, it's a sort of funny thing that just happened you see to do a practice that took two days and that's doing 500 miles a day you know which is quite a long way and we went out and he put all the notes down and his interpretation to me was just literally with his hand and I mean, I remember in one, one of the millimeters I went in, the, the brake pedal came off. I put my foot on the brake pedal, it snapped. <laughs> and, and I said, and I said, no, this dick, look down, and then he looks down, there's two pedals, <laughs> and he pulls his beard, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's a stupid thing, nothing to do with anything, but, uh, you know, the, there's, there's so much more to, to racing when, it, when it's dangerous, because the exhilaration of success is far higher. I mean, if you and I are playing a game and we're playing for chips, it's not very important, is it? But if we even play for one penny, uh, it makes it more important. But when you're playing with your life, that gives it a, a whole new meaning. That year, he finished second in the F1 title race to Fangio, a familiar story. Fangio was a fantastic man, he was a lovely man anyway, and, and he would never, ever go off. I mean, if you follow Jack Brabham, for instance, he'd go over the gravel and you get all the crap over you. See, <laughs> Fangio wouldn't do that. He'd let me sit there, and we were known as a train. And Neubau came up to me and he said, you know, I don't like this idea. He said, what happens if Fangio goes off? I said, well, Fangio does not go off. The master takes La Source, the pupil close behind him. Moss switched to Van Wall in 1957, preferring to drive for a British team. And when the legendary Fangio retired the following year, Moss was to come closer than ever to the title. In 1958, he was pitted against Mike Hawthorne for the championship. For Moss, the manner of competing was as important as the result. Three races before the end of the season at the Portuguese Grand Prix, Hawthorne was accused of reversing on the track. Moss put aside championship rivalries to defend his adversary's actions to the stewards. It was to prove decisive to the world championship. He went up the escape road and then had the car stalled and he had a push start. And they said, you can't, because you weren't allowed to push start. And the, the organizer said, look, I'm sorry, you're disqualified. And I said to him, look, this is very unfair. Mike didn't do anything wrong. When he was push started, he was not on the track. He was up the escape road. And so they reinstated his second place. And by, by reinstating that second, that uh, took the title from me again. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like running, you know, if you run against another guy racing, you don't want him with a, with a, with a broken ankle. Mm. And I felt, well, that was a fair deal. Despite missing out on the title, it was widely regarded Moss was the fastest driver of his generation and that his day would surely come. But in 1962, his career was to take a dramatic twist. Goodwood, Easter Monday, 1962. Number seven, so often his lucky seven careered off the track. Sterling received the severe injuries which were to end his days as a racing driver. I do remember coming out from a hotel, I used to stay in, in a friend of mine had a very small, well, it was a pub really, stay at his pub, and I was reversing out in the Lotus Elite that I had, and you know those, when, when you close gates, they, you have a thing they close up onto on the ground, and the thing was so low that when I went out I hit that, and so that really messed up my road car, so well, that wasn't a good start to the day. And then I woke up four weeks later, because I'd been unconscious for weeks and there were a lot of flowers in there. I thought, God, they're expecting somebody to die. And of course, I hadn't realized quite how close I'd been. Yeah. And uh, so I was paralyzed for six months and then got over that and then, uh, well, that was it. When he finally returned to testing, his skills weren't what they'd been. He chose to retire and British Motorsport missed out on one of the finest world champions it would have ever produced. In retirement, he turned to commentary and even returned to competitive racing in 1980 in the British Touring Car Championship. He became a Knight of the Realm in 2000 for his contribution to motorsport. But his happy retirement was marred when he was badly hurt falling down a lift shaft in his home in 2010. He finally retired from historic racing the following year, but was still involved in the sport and remained a familiar face in racing circles. Regarded as the best world champion the sport never had, more talented than many title winners, and with a sporting attitude that made him one of the real gentleman racers. We had enormous pleasure, we had enormous upsets, we had bad times and good times, but it was a wonderful life being a racing driver. Now, 
My quality of life, I can tell you, was far better than, than Lewis's. I mean, if Lewis wins a race, he's got to go over and speak to his, his um, sponsors and chat them up. And if I won a race, I could go and try and chase the girls. So I ask you, which is the better way to go? A legend not only in motorsport, but a household name, and one that will forever remain synonymous with Formula One.